Uh, thank you, Nathan, for the introduction. And I'm really happy to be here. A couple of uh, amazing talks so far, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. So the, the idea of the talk is just to give like a, an overview of how uh, machine learning has impacted the field uh, of oceanography. And I'm going to provide some examples also related to climate. Okay? The outline of the talk is the following. I'm going to mention the subfields on oceanography, and then I'm going to try to separate in groups the impact that uh, machine learning has had in oceanography. I provide some examples, and at the same time, I'm going to um, tell you what to expect in the near future. Okay? So, first, my background is in scientific computing and computer science. So, uh, the first thing to do is to ask my new best friend, ChatGPT, to provide a list of soft fields in oceanography. And I have uh, definitely been able to work in some of them, like uh, physical oceanography and maybe satellite oceanography, but I'm, I'm for sure not an expert in all of them. And rather than trying to give you the impacts in each of these soft fields, I try to create uh, a different separation, right? This uh, set of groups is uh, a hierarchical way in the impact of machine learning in oceanography, and that's how I see it. So the first one is, is that analysis. And you can see it of uh, everything that we can train a human to do, uh, but with data, but we are not able to, we don't have a physical model for it, okay? The second one, I call it the surrogate models. I couldn't find a better name for it. But it's uh, problems where we can solve with physical models, but they have some characteristics that make them uh, suitable for, for solving with machine learning. It may be that we have a lot of data for them, or it may be that it's just too complex to solve using a classic um, physical model. The still one I call it enhanced physical models, and I will, see, I will show you that um, we have some approximations that can be improved using machine learning, and that's uh, this group. And finally, this idea that uh, from data, we, we, we could be able to get some new uh, equation. Okay. So within the first group, uh, one of the subgroups, which is very large, is all this area of remote sensing and satellite image uh, analysis, right? There are, there are tons of things that are solved through machine learning in this area. And just to provide you uh, an example, in this case, uh, they are using machine learning to identify and count whales from satellite. And if we wanted to solve this problem in an automatic way a couple of years ago, it would have been really hard. First, we didn't have the machine learning tools to do it. And second, um, the resolution of the satellites was also not there. Okay. A second very large uh, subgroup within this uh, data analysis uh, separation that I am trying to explain is that analysis of ocean images, right? It's images and videos that I take inside the ocean, and then machine learning can help in many ways from detection, classification, identification, segmentation, all of that. And just to provide you uh, one example, this one was on one of the first um, big challenges in Kaggle. And one thing that I can point out is the year, right? It's 2015, and we are already classifying uh, plankton images, just to provide an idea of, uh, in this area, how long we have been using machine learning to get some contributions. And without going into the details, I mean, the, the, the winner of this um, challenge is used a lot of data augmentation in order to increase the size of the training data. And they use convolutional neural networks, which is classic uh, deep learning models, very uh, heavily used in computer vision. And within this group, because we have used it in, um, for many years, we are starting to see now these softwares that unify a lot of the machine learning tools uh, in, all, in, in a single open uh, source software, right? This, this uh, software, VM, is an initiative from uh, NOAA Fisheries, and it's tailored for problems in the ocean, but you can see that it solves many different things from object detection, uh, tracking, counting, uh, uh, registration of in, in a video, et cetera. But in this area, I think we are, we are starting to see this type of uh, unifying softwares that can help in many different ways. And this software is tailored also for problems in, in uh, oceanography 
And I also want to mention here, because I didn't touch it anywhere else, that another area where machine learning is helping a lot in, in oceanography is related with these autonomous uh, underwater vehicles, right? The driving of those vehicles, which is very expensive. You want to hire a human to do it. Now uh, there is start to do a lot of research that uh, <clears throat> uh, with a good success on how to do the driving automatically with machine learning. And within this group, and maybe the next one, one of the words that we have been uh, recently working on, and this is the poster that is over there, is trying to identify Lagrangian coherent eddies from a satellite image. I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it, just take a look at the poster and we can discuss it with a Luna Huron. So now moving into the second group that I call uh, surrogate models, here the idea is that, okay, yeah, we have some problems that are well suited to solve with machine learning. And the example that I have here, again, there are many, just because uh, many of you may be familiar with it, is trying to forecast El Nino uh, sovereign oscillation. So this is, a, this is kind of a pattern that appears here on the um, ocean that uh, it, it goes from El Nino and El Nina, it changes depending on the year, but it, it affects the whole climate in the planet. Right? So it's very important to be able to uh, forecast it. And in a classic way, we do it with these um, uh, general circulation models. And now we are able to uh, predict it with a very good skills using um, machine learning. Right? And this, uh, this is uh, represented with the orange line. And then the other lines are classic uh, global circulation models. And now we, we can forecast it or predict it with a much uh, cheaper way. And the second idea that I'm going to show you in this group, which is kind of similar, uh, is this work is called ENOC, Ensemble Oscillation Correction, which is kind of uses machine learning to provide some information on the um, on the physical systems. So imagine that you have a machine learning model that is able to predict this oscillation that we are seeing here is the Indian monsoon, and the patterns that you're seeing in the images coming is basically precipitation. So you can imagine that it's extremely important if we can predict accurately when this monsoon is going to start. And we use this machine learning system that is working correctly to approximate the oscillation to decide in an ensemble of a forecast of physical models to choose which of those ensemble members are closer to the machine learning uh, prediction. So in this way, machine learning is, is used to approximate the oscillation, but now we can also use it to decide uh, which of our physical models is better. And, uh, and then we can study those models uh, more deeply because we know the equations that are being used to uh, inside of it. And, and in this area, uh, previous work that we have been, uh, been involved is uh, forecasting ozone levels in Mexico City. Here the idea is you have information from multiple stations. What you have there is a map of uh, Mexico City and the uh, red dots are some uh, meteorological stations and you have data for like 30 years. And then uh, the innovative part of this work is that we incorporated the observations from the contaminants in the observations together with the output of the meteorological system in order to obtain uh, better results than if we were able to run a physical model uh, together with the chemistry module, which is very expensive. Right? Here on the, on the bottom right that you see is the prediction versus the observation, and the prediction is uh, happening 24 hours in advance. Uh, in, in polluted cities like Mexico City, you want to know that so that you can come up with a contingency method and uh, avoid people uh, breathing all the pollution. Right? So you apply it 24 hours in advance, and you try to avoid that the pollution increases for the next day. So going to the third, third group, uh, enhancing physical models, so we got, without going into the details, imagine that uh, we have these two things called the closures and the parameterizations that are basically approximations that we use in our physical models because we cannot run the full equations. It's too expensive to, to do it. That's one reason. 
So now we can we can move deeper into the hierarchy and try to use machine learning to improve in, into those parameterizations. And there has been some work that is relevant for oceanography. Uh, this work from uh, Avinav and Pierre called Neural Closure Models. It's getting a little bit technical, but don't, don't worry too much. What I want to uh, point out here is that the machine learning is moving from, from the observations on the data directly towards the, the equations, right? So those two terms that you see there in the middle are approximations used with machine learning or with deep learning. But now, the, of course, it's using data, but the data is coming from solving the, the differential equation rather than directly from the observation. And they show that um, they can obtain nice closures. One of the examples is this um, Burger's equation, which is relevant for, for oceanography. Okay. In this field, right now, we, we have um, a proposal to continue the work from uh, John Huang Liang. To, there is one of these parameterizations that is related with the mixing in the vertical mixing in the upper ocean, which is very important. And we want to try to implement it in an ocean model, right? That, that, that is uh, executed operational. And how it works is you have the high resolution model that does solve the vertical mixing. You run it in a very small location, and then you use the information from the output in order to train the neural net. And now we hope that the, the neural network um, has learned this parameterization, and then we can apply it in a different areas. And they show here on the, the first column is the error of the temperature through the parameterization learned by the machine learning. And the second and the third columns are the temperature errors that are obtained with classical uh, vertical mixing parameterization. Okay. And, and the last field, which is now is, is getting even more technical, but there's a strike, is, is trying to obtain the equations from the data. And, and that will be great, right? Imagine that you can go there and throw the balls from the tower a couple, couple hundred times, and then you get the equations, uh, and they are correct. But uh, I think we are still not there. One of the main um, references uh, related to this is Cindy, which is um, sparse identification of, of nonlinear dynamics. And this image is a little bit dense, but imagine that we are trying to obtain the equations from this uh, Lorentz integrator, which is uh, the one on the uh, top left. And the idea that I want to provide is that you need three things. One is the data that is provided, uh, in this case, synthetically. And then you need, uh, you still need to provide a set of possible terms in the equation. We are still not at the point where completely from data you can obtain the equation. You still need to provide a, a, a possible set of terms and then this uh, method allows you to obtain coefficients uh, for a sparse number of terms in, the, um, in your uh, proposed set of uh, options. And it's working fine for, for simple equations. I think uh, a better approach for the near future is this idea of uh, universal differential equations, where rather than trying to obtain the full equations from data, you want to obtain the equations only for some unknown terms. In this toy problem, uh, assume that you have those two equations and you don't know those two terms. You approximate them with machine learning. And once you are able to have a good approximation of those two terms, you use them to generate synthetic data relevant only for those two terms. And now you are able to uh, obtain uh, equations only for those two terms. And, uh, and things like that will be extremely useful, not only in oceanography, but also in, in other um, sciences. Okay. And, and that's it. I mean, it's just a, a general idea of how machine learning has impacted oceanography. We can definitely see that the biggest impact is in that analysis. We have been there for many years. And, and many projects and problems are affected at different levels through machine learning. Then the second part is this idea of um, uh, closures and parameterization that we have some good research going on. And I think in the next years, we will start seeing uh, these parameterizations moving more into operational use in, in, uh, in ocean models. And finally, well, in general, this scientific machine learning that may uh, provide 
starting to provide new insights on how to uh, develop new uh, knowledge for equations through, through scientific machine learning, but that's, that's still very, very new. Uh, of course, the example that I show from our work includes many, many collaborators. I just listed a, a couple of uh, ones there, and also some of the funding that is being related with the projects that I, that I mentioned. And that's it. Um, thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer some questions. So, okay, given the advance in AI machine learning model, do you think the prediction of the hurricane impacts will be improved substantially? Hurricane, the oh, hurricane track. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. So the question is, if AI can predict better the hurricane track, correct? With our experience, <laughs> with, our exper <laughs> with our experience in Florida, the problem with hurricanes, predicting hurricane tracks is, as, as we know, if you are Floridian, that if you miss the correct track for a couple hundred of kilometers, uh, you can create a, a lot of problems, right? If you, you try to solve for one track, you miss it for a couple of hundred kilometers, which maybe in a scientific way, it will still be a very good prediction of where the hurricane is going. But uh, in the economy, it's, it's, it's causing a lot of problems, right? So th there is definitely some uh, research work in, in that area that uses the current um, state or prediction for the physical model. And then you use machine learning to try to improve the track of the hurricane. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I can tell you, uh, I'm not sure about the details on how, how, how well that part is working, but for sure there is one area of research in, in, in trying to improve the track of the hurricane. At some scales <clears throat> uh, where a lot of small measurements are important, how much is a, there a sensor bottleneck in terms of having enough cheap, small, <coughs> excuse me, small sensors to collect, you know, massive amounts of temperature data, massive amounts of current data, things like that. Excuse me. I'm sorry, can I can only listen to the last part, which was the use of, of many more uh, small sensors, right? Oh, that definitely. I mean, that the, um, one of the main problems on oceanography is that we don't have enough observation, right? Satellite provide observations on the surface uh, for temperature, for salinity. And then we have a lot of observations from gliders, ships, buoys, um, uh, et cetera. But if you look at the whole ocean, the, the, the number of observation is still very sparse. Um, so definitely for some research, the problem is that you don't want also to fill the ocean with, uh, with the sensors, right? But there is... Uh, for coastal, for example, coastal research, it will definitely be useful to have uh, more observations uh, because it's, it's at that resolution it will be it will improve for sure. Are there any more questions? I have one. Yeah. Um, so, with the advent of these uh, foundation models that have come out recently, um, kind of making a nice uh, splash into the AI research world. I'm curious if you can speculate as best you can on how some of those techniques may be incorporated into the climatology and oceanography world, things like uh, self-supervised learning, multitask learning, and their ability to learn uh, these um, underlying characteristics that can be used to generalize to do much more uh, useful tasks. Okay. So, yeah, I can imagine that uh, all those uh, semi-supervised uh, techniques uh, will be useful in, in, in different hierarchies, right? In, in this hierarchy of uh, levels, they are also useful because, for example, even though on the first level, that analysis, we have had a lot of impact from machine learning, the truth is there is still so much data that is not labeled by anyone. So we cannot use it through machine learning. And these techniques of uh, active learning or semi-supervised learning can help reduce the time to get the additional data that can be uh, later used to train a, a machine learning model. Uh, deeper in the hierarchy, uh, yeah, I will, have to, I will have to think more about, about that. Right? How can we use uh, semi-supervised learning to improve this enhancing of the model uh, during the equation? So for the problem where you learn equation from the data, 
uh, will comment on the, how the noise will affect the result? Yeah. Uh, so, so definitely, I mean, the noise will cause uh, problems there because if you want to get a coefficient that is representative of your data, but you have some noise on the data, that coefficient uh, in your terms won't be perfect, right? Uh, and it also affects the terms that you are learning, but you can imagine maybe that the terms that you are, that the terms that get affected through noise are the ones that are, um, uh, how to say, like a less impact into the overall uh, prediction. So yeah, this is for sure is a problem of noise from observations. That's right. 